Hello, do you love going behind the scenes? Well, today I am taking you behind the scenes to one of the ICBT training sessions that I did this fall on module three. Module three is all about how OCD draws you in with a really good story and then teaches you how to write your obsessional story to become more aware of how OCD works and gets you drawn in. Hello, and welcome to Christian Faith and OCD with Carrie Bach. I'm a Christ follower, wife and mother, licensed professional counselor who helps Christians struggling with OCD get to a deeper level of healing. When I couldn't find resources for my clients with OCD, God called me to bring this podcast to you with practical tools for developing greater peace. We're here to bust through the shame and stigma surrounding struggling with OCD as a Christian, sharing hopeful stories of healing, and helping you replace uncertainty with faith. I'm here to help you let go of the past and future to walk in the present abundant life God has for you. So let's dive right into today's episode. Brothers and sisters in Christ, OCD warriors, Are you sick and tired of fighting with OCD? Have you tried exposure therapy or tried finding counseling from a Christian perspective and just have come up short? I know so many people have told me that they have a Christian counselor, but that person doesn't know about OCD or they've gone to OCD counseling and something just didn't feel right because the person didn't understand their faith. I want you to know that I'm here for you, and that's why I'm excited to announce that in January, we're going to be teaching through the 12 modules of ICBT. We talked about ICBT in more depth in episode 119 and episode 133. I will be teaching one module per week from mid-January to the end of March. If you can't make the live trainings, everything's recorded and put in an online course platform for you to access. If you think you might even slightly be interested or you're interested in being interested in finding out more information, please join our waiting list at kerrybach.com slash OCD. About three-fourths of the way down the page, there's an option for you to put in your name and email address. Let me help you have a different relationship with OCD in 2025. Today we're talking about stories, the obsessional story. As I started to think about this obsessional story process, I thought we tell ourselves stories all the time, right? And it's not always an OCD story. We go through life, we have experiences and we interpret them and we tell ourselves a story based on our past experience, based on other things that we've heard, based on what we know about God and scripture. It's not just about OCD. It is, that's what we're here to talk about and have a better relationship with. But just noticing like when you have experiences, what are you telling yourself? Are you telling yourself the shoulds, I should have done better, known better, been better, whatever. Are you telling yourself, yeah, you know, you should have expected that to happen because it happened in the past. Uh, You know, a trauma story of, yep, you know, there you go again, experiencing this. Just kind of be aware of that. So you are, as a Christian, tasked with not trusting everything that you see or hear, but really testing and seeing, is this coming from God or is this from falsehood? So our main ideas are that OCD draws you in with a good storyline and that awareness of that storyline is the first step to changing it. I like to say that OCD has like these lifetime movie versions that they tell you. It's so vivid. Sometimes you can see it happening. There's a lot of intense emotions that goes along with it. Just thinking about stories in general, I put this little Incredible Hulk guy on here. They draw us in with a certain level of emotion. Stories are believable or relatable. 
even though we've never seen a guy turn into this giant green man and start destroying something, we feel related to this story because we've all had anger in our lives. Maybe we've been destructive at different points and he doesn't want this to happen. It just is something that kind of takes over him and happens. So even though you look at the Marvel comics and things, there's lots of stuff happening or people being able to control time or see all of the outcomes, right? That's one of the characters, I guess, can see all the potential outcomes that could happen. And people are flying and different things happening. But there are some of the core storylines, the characters, we really relate to them. We feel for them. I wasn't really into a whole lot of these movies. And I went with one of my friends and people were just like to go see Endgame and people were just crying in the theater, right? Like these are characters, you know, they're not real, but we are drawn in and we feel something. And that's what makes a good story, right? Like that's a really good story that draws you in. And there's some kind of outcome or ending to them. So there are some factual elements that can be woven in even to OCD stories. All right. Now for a story about my pen. This is a pen that I have in my office. It's a purple pen. I like the color purple. So let's say that if you were in the office and I was like, hey, do you want to write with this pen? You probably would say, sure, why not? Like, I don't know. It looks like a good pen. It clicks. It works. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, yeah, it writes really well. I like it. So you probably would feel okay with this pen unless you like had major contamination and you were like, no, I don't touch other people's stuff, that type of stuff. And then you might be like, "Eh, I'm not sure about that. But if I could tell you a story about this pen where I said, yeah, this is a really great pen. And I want to tell you the story of how I, I got this pen. I mean, I didn't just get this pen at the store. I was out in you know, the park and there was a pile of dog poop and I noticed this pen sticking out and I thought, oh, that pen looks like it would write really good if I cleaned it up or, hey, my favorite color is purple. I think I'll take that pen and I took it out of the dog poop and I washed it off and I Clorox wiped it. It's fine. Everything's good. It's all right. It's like, I mean, what's the problem? Do you notice feeling any differently about wanting to hold the pen now versus when I first started talking to you about it? Most people, when I tell them the story, are then like, oh, that's gross. Like, I'm not touching that pen. You know, who does that? But the point is, what changed? Did the pen actually change or did we just change the story about the pen? And then when we change the story about the pen, that caused us to feel differently about it. Not only your five senses, which do get distrusted at times in OCD, but internal sense data. What do you really want? And how do you know that? Like I can say, just random example, like I really want pizza for dinner. Like how do I know that? I've been just craving pizza. I like pizza, whatever. I'm just making stuff up as we go along, right? But really being able to tune into your own emotional experience or your own desires is really important. I've talked to people before. OCD will make you feel like you have an urge to do something, but an internal like urge or pull towards something is not the same thing as a desire is actually wanting to do that. So that may be something that you have to tease out in your own story. And then what you actually value or believe. All right. Jenny's obsessional story goes like this. My husband didn't kiss me this morning before he left for work. That is a true statement. That did really happen to her. But now this obsessional doubt enters then. What if he has fallen out of love with me? I mean, Sally is going through a divorce right now and her husband just left her out of nowhere. That's the hearsay evidence. Just because it happened to Sally doesn't mean it'll happen to Jenny. But that's what OCD wants her to believe that it will. My ex-boyfriend did something similar. Ah, personal experience. OCD feels like it's really like, hey, I've really got some evidence here for you. I read an article about how if your man doesn't kiss you before you leave the house, that is one sign he's out the door. He could be cheating on me. It's possible. Now we've got like you know, almost like another uh, obsessional doubt coming in there, right? Like, oh, what if he's cheating? People leave and get divorces all the time. Yeah, I really can't argue with that fact. Um, What if I'm next? I couldn't handle it. Consequences of obsessional doubt. This piece, like of not being able to handle it, that kind of dips the toe into the water of the feared self-theme. 
you may be saying like, oh, well, that's a nice story, Carrie. Now what do I do with it? Just remember that you're still in the phases of building awareness. We're not necessarily intervening right now, but if you can intervene or you may pick up on like, oh, now that I pick up on that OCD, I'm not going to give into it as much as I would have before. I'm not going to entertain it like I would have in the past. So just kind of be aware of that piece coming down the pike. All right. Talking about having a shameful thought, maybe it's a sexual or blasphemy thought. And then like, oh, that goes into I shouldn't be having this as a Christian. What does this mean? What if this means I'm not a good Christian or don't love God? And I think I stuck with the don't love God because obviously some of these could be going a lot of different directions, right? And then these are some of the things that I'm the potential consequences and I'm calling myself. Uh, what if I don't love God? Well, not everyone does. That's a fact. Rules, you know, take your thoughts captive. Watch the things that come into your mind that you think about. Lots of information on that in various places. Spiritual guidance, pastors, teachers, authors, podcasters. So much, so much information out there now. Personal experience of maybe what a former church taught and then anything possible according to OCD. So let's look at this obsessional story. So I have these intrusive sexual thoughts. It's a fact. I can't change that. What if I don't really love God and that's why I have these thoughts? So that would be our obsessional doubt that we stuck with for this example. But it could have gone, as you see, there were other obsessional doubts. And so whichever one you choose, that probably is going to take this story a little bit different in a direction. That's okay. That's what my previous church said hearsay. I have to rebuke this thought in the name of Jesus. That's a compulsion. I have to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. That is true according to the Bible. When I was addicted to pornography, I was dwelling on thoughts I shouldn't. That would be a personal experience. And if I don't win the battle of my mind, I'm giving the enemy a foothold. Consequences of the doubt. So some of you may be a little bit overwhelmed too on, okay, Carrie, I have a lot of different obsessions. What do I write my obsessional story on? I'm going to give you some guidance. Sometimes, very occasionally, the anxiety about writing the obsessional story or seeing it out like just out there can be super, super high for certain themes. So I would say, if that's the case, we're really in the interest of you learning the process right now, right? If that's the case, if it is too anxiety provoking, I mean, like going to give you a panic attack is what I'm trying to say. Not to say that writing obsessional stories shouldn't cause you any anxiety. But if you're like panicking, trying to write your obsessional story, maybe try working on something that is either a past experience, like it's not bothering you now, but it did in the past, just so that you can learn and process it and sit with it. Or picking something that is still an obsession, but it's a lower level like not going to send you into a panic. And then once you feel like you have the flow of what you're writing and the process of putting those pieces together, then that is going to help you be able to probably sit with the harder one. Even if we have multiple stories, the feared self or vulnerable self theme is going to run between those stories. So they're going to be similar. A lot of times there is a common thread and that's going to be your common thread. So if you do end up like writing a couple stories, if you feel inclined to do that, I wouldn't literally like write more than two. I mean, remember, we're not wanting to like obsess about treatment. So if you wrote a couple stories and kind of compared them, I was like, oh, okay. Like there should be some type of overlap or pattern that you're seeing rely whether it's hey i'm seeing in both of these stories that i'm really relying on hearsay evidence or i'm seeing in both of these stories that i'm really relying on per past personal experience that may be related to my trauma or i'm noticing it's like the same exact personal experience even though the themes may be different for you and you would want to look at like okay what can I glean from this? What's the pattern here? Because obviously you're not wanting, like I said, if you have a lot of different themes, you're not wanting to run the gamut for every single thing in your life. You don't want to have to do this, I guess, is what I'm trying to say for every single thing. And usually information like this will generalize. So recognize that you only got about 12 minutes of a 50-minute training. Obviously, this was not intended to be comprehensive, but just to give you a snippet and a sneak peek 
inside the training and the examples that I use to help people understand the concept. Start each session with mindfulness, a prayer. There's a scripture verse for every week. And we dive into the lesson. And all of that is so intentional so that we can put our mind, heart, and spirit in alignment and in the right place. We've had some amazing question and answer times in the beginning and end. So know that you completely have the freedom to ask questions. People will type them in the chat or they will email me privately and I can answer it publicly. So there, even if you aren't able to attend live, there's still opportunities to ask questions so that you can really get in there and apply these materials. Next week, we're going behind the scenes again to talk through writing alternative stories. And I'm going to share a true experience that happened to me, how I wrote an obsessional story about it. I did make up that part and then what a potential alternative story would be. Definitely tune in for part two next week. Until next time, may you be comforted by God's great love for you. Were you blessed by today's episode? If so, I'd really appreciate it if you would go over to your iTunes account or Apple Podcasts app on your computer if you're an Android person and leave us a review. This really helps other Christians who are struggling with OCD be able to find our show. Christian Faith and OCD is a production of By the Well Counseling. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be a substitute for seeking mental health treatment in your area.